All right. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. We got June 30th. We got the recording. We are recording. Uh, the document camera. I've made it a co-host. And I have spotlight. I tried to pin it today. I didn't see that option. But we do have a spotlight and we got the co-host. <clears throat> Super. Okay. <clears throat> yep, so we're moving into chapter seven. Now, I did broadcast an announcement uh, concerning midterm one. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, prepared a document. I posted it on B courses. I broadcast an announcement. You should have received the announcement if you did not. You know, notify me uh, and or Chris will troubleshoot that. <clears throat> but there is now a folder called midterm one. Midterm one is our first midterm. Later this summer, we'll have midterm two. Okay. But this uh, 10 days from today, we have midterm one. You now, <clears throat> 10 days from today, remember, we're moving twice as quickly as we would during a normal semester. So it is as if I had given you information 20 days prior to the exam, which is very generous, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so we got the information that midterm one tells you which material in the textbook, and again, it's chapters five through seven inclusive with the deletion of some sections, and those sections are clearly identified in the document which I posted. Okay, so that's uh, the midterm one. <clears throat> I got a further special office hour this week. Remember this week is special because we are affected by a holiday. Further. Okay. So the idea here is, you know, uh, this summer we have basically two homework assignments due every week. That's because of the fantastic, extraordinary rate at which we're doing this material this summer. Um, therefore, I, as you know, I have office hours, I have an office hour tonight, <clears throat> right? Uh, Tuesday, 8 p.m., yeah? Tonight at 8 p.m., I, I should say it's afternoon, the sun is still very much in the sky at 8 p.m., in these parts at least. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we have an office hour tonight. Tomorrow morning, got that one. Those are the two that I announced yesterday. Now I'm going to announce a further office hour, Saturday, July 4th. Okay, remember the official federal holiday is on July 3rd. So I put this office hour on July 4th. Again, it's 10 a.m. Okay, and I see a question in the chat window. Here's the question. Will you post a practice midterm exam or do you suggest us to review homework and to do extra prompts? <clears throat> Great question. So I will post one or more practice exams. Yes, I will be posting those soon. Furthermore, <clears throat> for the exam, you should look at the one star problems. So I can put that here by midterm one. So Taylor has a nice scheme uh, whereby homework problems are roughly categorized according to their difficulty level. We have the one-star problems and the two-star problems, which are appropriate for this exam. Three-star problems, not appropriate. So the hieroglyphics, I'm using a mixture here of written English and hieroglyphics. Okay, yep, so excellent <clears throat> point there in the chat window. You very much should prepare for the exam by looking at problems in Taylor. And more specifically, you should look at the one star and the two star problems in Taylor. Uh, the three star problems are intended for many hours of enjoyment, but they're not appropriate for a midterm exam. The purpose is not to overwhelm you and or rush through problems. That's not the purpose of the exam. The exam uh, is, 
will be designed so that if you have prepared, it should be a reasonable effort, smooth sailing, and uh, a good time should be had by all. All right, it's gonna be a feel good midterm. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, so in addition to the office hours I mentioned, right, today, tomorrow, we got this Saturday one, and this is very much uh, <clears throat> in harmony with our homework cycle. And then we have another uh, comment in the chat window. Will the emphasis then be almost entirely? Uh, yeah, right. So, yeah, <clears throat> the, the exam covers chapters five through seven. Uh, we did start the course with some foundation material where we reviewed foundation principles, which should have been covered in your first year physics course. Um, yep, but the emphasis absolutely, as you point out, chapters five through seven inclusive. Okay, uh, the handout, <clears throat> yep, we have the details there. And yeah, great question. Thank you all, all for all the remarks. Uh, let's see, yeah, let's keep a good lively dialogue going here in the chat window. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So uh, let's see, what else do we have? A reading assignment. Okay, so by Friday, we wanna finish chapter seven. Okay, as you know, the reading assignment includes material which will not be on the exam, so you can adjust your emphasis. <clears throat> if you would like to focus 100% on the exam, then you can actually skip those sections, which I mentioned in the document. Um, but it's important to understand those are part of the reading assignment. You should read those uh, <clears throat> when you find the time to do that. So yeah, we're gonna, this is what, this is in terms of our navigation through the material. By Friday, we wanna finish chapter seven. Okay, so, um, yeah, so let's get right to work here on the physics. <clears throat> um, in our last meeting, uh, we delineated again, this comparison between chapter six and chapter seven, chapter six, pure mathematics, useful skills. In chapter seven, now this remarkable formulation of mechanics using variational principles. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about this kind of uh, verbally first. Uh, a formulation of mechanics using variational principles. Now, <clears throat> we all, we still love uh, Newton's second law. The idea that force equals mass times acceleration. If you have a point particle, you compute the total vector force on that particle. Uh, that enables you to determine the acceleration, right? Force equals mass times acceleration. So it's a wonderful law of motion. That's a differential equation, right? It's telling you the second derivative of the position, second time derivative. A wonderful differential equation which governs the motion. And for, furthermore, it's very intuitive. We have intuition with forces and we have intuition with ex acceleration. So we certainly love Newton's second law. The variational principles, <clears throat> we're gonna show that they're equivalent to Newton's second law. Furthermore, there is some tremendous, uh, <clears throat> there are some advantages. There, there are things we should say here. The advantages to the variational principles and one problem, just by way of example, <clears throat> one problem here, suppose you have a wire loop and you have a motor which forces this loop to rotate about a vertical axis. In terms of kitchen gadgets, think of the gadgets we have in the kitchen, there's a so-called mixer, right? If you wanna mix some batter and bake something, the mixer has this motorized, uh, actually two of them typically, these motorized uh, uh, egg beater things. Anyways, uh, the, the, the mental image here is you have a wire loop, a motor is forcing this loop to spin uh, at, a, at a constant rate of uh, angular velocity. Now, in contrast to the uh, egg beater, we're gonna think about a bead, a small point particle, which is constrained to move along that wire. Uh, now using Newton's second law, it would be challenging. You'd have to figure out the constraint force there's some sort of interaction between the bead and the wire, and that would be rather challenging. It's remarkable that these variational principles can get you the correct answer. You can easily solve for the motion of this point particle on the egg beater. It's, it's extraordinary. In fact, it's so easy that some 
instructors criticize Lagrangian mechanics because you get the answer so quickly without the insight that we had in Newton's second law. You don't directly compute the constraint forces. It turns out in Lagrangian mechanics, there's no need to compute the constraint forces. You can easily find the motion of that point particle constrained to the wire loop, which is rotated by a motor. So we're going to investigate that problem um, in detail. And so those are the main themes here. We're going to formulate classical mechanics in an alternative manner using a Lagrangian. The other big advantage is that the Lagrangian is a scalar. We're going to talk about kinetic energy and potential energy. These are scalars. They're, you don't have to worry about which way a vector is pointing. When you use Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. The force, we're talking about the total force. That's a vector sum of all the forces acting on a particle. Uh, sometimes there's some tedium. It requires some effort to figure out which way these, direct, these vectors are pointing. They have directions, right? You have to add up the vectors to get the total force. In, in uh, some of these full-blown three-dimensional problems, some effort is required to do vector additions. The nice thing about the Lagrangian formulation is that we're working entirely with scalars, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And um, you can add scalars with ease. You just add them up and it will actually be subtracted. We'll be doing kinetic energy minus potential. So yep, this is what we're gonna do now in chapter seven, uh, the fascinating world of uh, a formulation of classical mechanics using uh, variational principles. Okay. So we recently talked about the shift in notation. Uh, we're going to set up a variational principle using the Lagrangian. All right, so here we go, chapter seven. The Lagrangian. <clears throat> It's a capital cursive L. We are now justified in setting aside some time to work on our calligraphy, which we should all do, because it's a lot of fun to draw a capital cursive L. Uh, you will be failing the course if you can't do this, so definitely, I'm kidding, that's supposed to be a little joke, but it's fun actually, draw that capital cursive L. Um, <clears throat> here's the definition, it's the kinetic energy. Okay. So this equation here is now one of the centerpieces of chapter seven. Um, written in this form, you see it's extraordinarily simple. It's just L equals T minus U. We have to be cognizant of the mathematical framework here. There's a mathematical setting. Okay. And to really appreciate this, um, we must talk about the classical state of the system. Right? There's the so-called configuration space this is the collection of all the positions. You could have a multi-particle problem. If you record all the positions of the particle, that's the configuration. So basically that's the position information. <clears throat> but for the kinetic energy, T is the kinetic energy here. Okay, so <clears throat> for the kinetic energy, we need to know about the uh, velocities, right? In some cases, just the uh, speed, right? The magnitude of the velocity will suffice, but we can look at rather complicated problems, multi -com like the double pendulum, for example, one pendulum with another pendulum suspended off the end of it. And of course, later in the course, we'll talk about rigid body motion. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the classical state, now typically, for what we're going to do, the potential energy depends only on the position coordinates. Towards the end of chapter seven, we'll talk about the quote unquote velocity dependent potentials, but that's really outside of the framework that we have here. <clears throat> we're going to set up a framework where the potential energy just depends on the position of the particles and the kinetic energy uh, can depend in general on the position and uh, the velocity. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're gonna formulate a variational principle uh, where we're gonna integrate this Lagrangian. And as we pointed out recently, the Lagrangian will play the role of this lowercase f function, all right, that um, we talked about throughout chapter six. So 
what we're going to do here, the integral, so that's the capital S, this integral, okay, and we'll talk about this minus sign uh, some more in a moment. It's certainly a glaring question. Why is it T minus U? Wouldn't it be cool if it was T plus U? That would be the total mechanical energy. But no, it's T minus U. We'll talk about that minus sign in a moment. <clears throat> okay, so here's our variational principle. Okay, so this is the so-called action integral. Now, uh, let me just, okay, I just had to reposition the chat window just to make sure I see the chat window. <clears throat> okay, this is the action integral. Action, that's a technical term in physics, right? You remember uh, from your <clears throat> quantum mechanics course, Planck's constant is actually a fundamental quantum of action. Notice, kinetic energy measured in joules. Potential energy measured in joules. Lagrangian, the units are joules. All right, let's be aware of the units. Okay, now we got joule seconds. This integral capital S has dimension, dimensions of joule seconds. That's the same as h bar. And so we won't be talking about quantum mechanics here, but uh, it's often said that h bar is a fundamental, fundamental quantum of action. Okay, so this is the action. The action was studied intensively, you know, for at least a century prior to quantum mechanics. Um, so this action is very much a notion uh, from classical physics, right? This Lagrangian, and of course, we'll talk about the Hamiltonian formulation later. But right now, we're interested in the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics. Okay. Uh, and if you speak German, um, <coughs> the uh, Planck's constant, that's Planck's Wirkungsquant. It's a quantum of action, okay? So right there in the uh, official subtitle of Planck's constant, it's a quantum of action. All right, so yeah, when you start developing quantum theories, you, you quantize. And actually there are several, in classical mechanics, there are several different things that are called action. So this is the action integral. <clears throat> All right, so you see the structure. The structure is identical to what we had in chapter six. We had this abstract, mathematical framework in chapter six. And at that time, we typically integrated from x1 to x2, right? Well, now this is the time t. It's wonderful that we now have physical intuition. We're integrating from t1 to t2. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so this is a variational principle. So there you have it. <clears throat> that rectangular box, which I just drew, that rectangular box, which says delta S equals zero, that's the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics. Okay, you, you can see that's this pretty darn compact notation and not, and not terribly illuminating uh, at, at face value there. <clears throat> but this is a variational principle. It's saying that the actual trajectory of a particle, suppose you're studying a particle, we'll begin by looking at a single particle moving in a three-dimensional space under the influence of a conservative force. And we will see that this thing that I just uh, <clears throat> indicated with the rectangular box, this variational principle gives us the same exact equations of motion as Newton's second law. Okay, let's address now this question. Why is the Lagrangian T minus U? Okay, uh, <clears throat> why is that? Well, the quote, there's a quote in our textbook. Uh, let's begin with the quote in our textbook quote, there seems to be no simple answer, unquote. <clears throat> uh, that's right from the text. Okay, and I think that it's, it's good that we talk about this quote. Uh, we're just going to have to accept that the Lagrangian is T minus U. Uh, this is just the way it is, folks. Uh, with a Lagrangian T minus U, you get the correct equations of the motion. If for some reason you insisted that this should be T plus U, you will get the wrong equations of motion. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, we're, we will talk about cases, and we did allude to these theorems. Remember recently we, we talked about the fact that if the Lagrangian is time independent, that means if there's no explicit occurrence of the variable t. Obviously there are implicit occurrences because the position of the particles, they depend on time. But if there's no explicit dependence on the time t, then 
The total mechanical energy, that's T plus U, then T plus U is a constant of the motion. Along the trajectory of any particle, T plus U will be constant. Okay, that's what we expect there. But for the moment, um, <clears throat> we should begin with that quote from the text. There, quote, there seems to be no simple example, answer, why it's T minus U. Uh, and that's important to appreciate that this is a, a fundamental observation that if you formulate a variational principle with T minus U as uh, this quantity script L, which was called F in chapter six, then you get the correct equations of motion. Uh, we can say a few more things. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this statement here, delta S equals zero, notice this is equivalent to the following. Uh, that thing I just drew there, that's a double-headed logic arrow. So a logical arrow pointing to the right, and at the same time, a logical arrow pointing to the left. This statement in the box is equivalent to the following. Okay. So this is just a trivial rewrite. I haven't really done anything amazing. I just used the fact that L is T minus U. Well, if the first order change in S is zero, that's simply identical saying that the first order <coughs> change in the kinetic energy integral is equal to the first order change in the potential energy integral. Uh, so in that sense, <coughs> we're, we're, we're uh, looking at first order changes in kinetic energy integrated like so. and uh, yeah, so that's another way. In some sense, this form removes the offending minus sign and it treats the T and U on the same footing. Again, this, but it's not really a deep insight. Uh, now, one other thing which a researcher recently pointed out to me, here's what you can do. Again, answering the question, why is it T minus U? Why is it T minus U? This is a really fascinating calculation. You can, in the context of general relativity, remember, General relativity is a theory of gravity where you have a space-time which has an intrinsic, it's a Riemannian manifold, right? So we have notions of uh, distances along uh, uh, trajectories in a four-dimensional space-time. So you have this uh, <clears throat> geometric theory of gravity. You can look at the weak field limit. That would be appropriate here in our solar system, for example. Um, the, the gravitational forces are weak and, and <clears throat> When you, when you say that kind of a, uh, when you make that statement, you should say weak compared to what? Okay, so there are ways to talk about the curvature of space-time in, in a dimensionless manner. So <clears throat> another way to say, we have fairly weak uh, space-time curvature here in our solar system. You don't see really extreme deformations. If you draw a square on a piece of paper and move it somewhere, it looks pretty square over there. So we don't have really extreme extremely curved space-time here. If you're near a black hole, watch out because space-time is gonna get pretty curved. But here in the solar system, we have the so-called weak field limit. And you can look at the implications of Einstein's theory of gravity in the weak field limit, okay? And you recover Newtonian gravity and <coughs> Newton's law uh, of motion, right? Force equals mass times acceleration with a Newtonian gravitational field. And um, then you can prove this minus sign here. In other words, <clears throat> you take Einstein's theory of relativity, you look at the weak field limit, and you can actually recover this, this T minus U uh, variational principle. So that's one, that's the only example I know of a, a really uh, a detailed calculation, which at the end of the day gives you a T minus U. <clears throat> okay, so let's accept this variational principle, um, and let's dive right in. Let's see how this variational principle works and how it agrees with Newton's second law. Okay, so unconstrained motion. <clears throat> yep, time to breathe easy because we're gonna talk about unconstrained motion, right? This should, uh, right, I'm just kidding. Uh, this, this is supposed to be uh, not so stressful because it's unconstrained kind of thing. Okay, so what we're seeing here, uh, 
we are not talking about the case of a particle. For example, you could have a problem where a, a particle is forced to move on a two-dimensional surface or <clears throat> what we mentioned earlier today, a particle forced to remain on a one-dimensional curve. In the laboratory, you could accomplish this by having a stiff wire frame and having a bead. You can manufacture a bead by taking a small sphere and drilling a hole through it. That's what we mean when we say bead. Take a little bitty sphere, drill a small hole through there, and thread that onto a thin wire. Uh, make sure to put some oil on there so we're sliding without friction. Okay, so that's what we mean when we have a particle constrained to move on a lower dimensional manifold. It could be a particle constrained to move on a uh, wire. That would be a one dimensional curve. Or you can have a particle constrained to move on a two dimensional surface. <clears throat> okay, so similar in spirit to what we're doing on the homework, right? Uh, <clears throat> The current homework, you know, number two, assignment number two. Uh, we do have a problem where we have this h of x comma y. h of x comma y in that problem describes a landscape. You can think of um, the Berkeley Hills. Think of the last time you took a walk up there in the Berkeley Hills. I hope, you know, I understand not everyone has had that privilege or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, think of a rolling landscape, uh, especially when you go east of the Berkeley Hills, you get to Briones, right? Very very much a rolling hilly landscape. That's what you should think of when you have this h of x comma y. And of course, in the current homework assignment, we're going to compute using the calculus of variations. If you identify two points in the landscape, take a couple of those wooden stakes and plant them into the ground. And the question is, what's the shortest path on the rolling landscape between those two points? Right? Interesting problem from the calculus of variations. Obviously, there could be multiple solutions, right? We've seen that for the surface of the Earth. Uh, you can talk about a perfectly spherical Earth. You can talk about an oblate Earth. But imagine taking two cities that are on the equator. This is a nice starting point. And you can talk about the various special cases that occur. <clears throat> for example, you can take two cities in Brazil that are on the equator. There's uh, an obvious uh, shortest distance between them. But you can also go around the whole Earth and get another path, which is an extremum, okay? And we can talk about cases that are neither minimal nor maximal. But uh, the point here is now, this, uh, this discussion in chapter seven, when we have a surface, and you could describe a surface with one of these functions, h of x comma y, a particle could be constrained. And often we say just by assumption, the particle must move on this surface, <clears throat> okay? In, in the laboratory, you could uh, accomplish this by taking two plexiglass surfaces that are curvy and arrange for a very small gap between the two surfaces and again have a particle moving between these two surfaces, a very small gap. So again, you can arrange, you know, you can devise methods like this to um, achieve the goal of having a particle moving in a three-dimensional space but constrained to move on a two-dimensional surface. Okay. That's, uh, and again, this is where the Lagrangian formulation will really shine. We can solve those problems with ease, right? Um, <clears throat> but first, let's talk about unconstrained motion. So there's no constraint force. We do have forces. We assume that there's a conservative force, and uh, it's necessary for us to say those words because if you have a conservative force, then and only then, you can introduce this, and I'm pointing with a pen, the capital U, the potential energy, the force is minus the gradient of the potential. Okay, so here we go, unconstrained motion. The kinetic energy, no surprise there. Pythagoras is telling us that the square of the velocity here, we got x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. That is to say we have a velocity vector for the kinetic energy. We don't care which way that vector is pointing. We just need to know the square of the length. And there you have it. So this is the kinetic energy. Notice this kinetic energy here for this unconstrained motion in three-dimensional space. If you're using the Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z, then the kinetic energy depends on x dot, y dot, and z dot. 
It doesn't care about X, Y, and Z themselves. Remember, those are independent variables. The potential Okay, so here's what we're doing for the potential energy. This is now an arbitrary potential energy. You can dream up any sort of uh, conservative force that you like. For example, a uniform gravitational field. To get approximation for a laboratory experiment, you would take a uniform grav. Then this potential would be only a function of z, assuming your z-axis is vertically upwards uh, or downwards. Um, and again, for a uniform gravitational field in the lab, it would be independent of x1. Another example, suppose you have a very massive star at the origin and you have a spaceship or a planet or a comet uh, moving under the influence of this gravitational force. In that case, the potential energy would depend on the distance to the origin. So that would be the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So those are a couple of examples. That's the kind of thing you should have in mind. Another one, the three-dimensional harmonic oscillator your potential energy is proportional to the square of the distance to the or origin. So the potential would be a constant times x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That's the square of your distance. So all of these <laughs> examples are examples of motion, unconstrained motion. There's no constraint force. So we don't have a particle that's forced to remain on the surface. Um, but we do have forces acting on the particle. And this uh, u could be the sum. Right, you could have an electric force, a gravitational force, et cetera. The vector sum, let's say we're doing electrostatics, so you have a potential. Okay, yep, so uh, certainly possible here to have some very fascinating physics problems. So there's unconstrained motion. Let's appreciate now that the Lagrangian, is a function of six variables here. Okay, and again, it's T minus U. <clears throat> In this case, the kinetic energy is a function of X dot, Y dot, Z dot. And the potential is a function uh, of X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> okay, notice uh, this is still not the most general Lagrangian. The most general Lagrangian okay, the most general Lagrangian has a time dependence T. And remember the similarity we, we outlined this last time uh, in chapter six. Remember what we looked at, we had our function f right? Let's get, uh, I think a pencil would be good here. Yep. This was the situation in chapter six. If you have uh, multiple coordinates, very similar story, you would have, for example, a y1, y2, y3. <coughs> I one prime. Okay, so that's the structure that we had in chapter six. Now let's make the connection here. Remember now in chapter seven, the time is the independent variable. In chapter six, we call that X. And uh, of course, each of these are corresponding quantities here. I don't wanna make a big mess of it. In chapter six, we use prime for differentiation. Perfectly good notation. Uh, in physics, we like to use the dot for time derivatives. So yeah, <clears throat> we have seven variables here. This Lagrangian really is a function of these seven variables in general. You could have a potential that depends on time. Right? No problem there. Time dependent force. Okay, so that's the big picture. And we know what to do. We have been studying chapter six intensively. We're going to use the Euler-Lagrange equations. Here we go with the Euler-Lagrange equations. We have a clear prescription. <clears throat> 
in the language of chapter six, we would start computing some partial derivatives. We would compute the partial of f with respect to y and the partial of f with respect to y prime. Okay, and now we have this new notation. <laughs> We're gonna compute. So with these square brackets, I will indicate this was a parenthetical remark to chapter six. All right, that was a remark back on chapter. Let's resume with our discussion here now, chapter seven. We must compute a partial derivative. Okay, x is one of the dependent variables. Remember the time is the independent variable. X is one of the dependent variables. And we gotta compute this partial derivative of L with respect to X, okay? Using the rules for differentiation. Remember the context. At this point, <clears throat> these six variables here are independent. For a time dependent Lagrangian, you would have seven independent variables. In some sense, this too was a parenthetical remark. Let's indicate that like so. That was a parenthetical remark that in general, you could have a time dependence. Yeah, so we really wanna resume with this discussion here. I've indicated that with that very dramatic arrow. We're taking this Lagrangian, we're going to work with it in great detail now. Okay, so X is one of the dependent variables. We must compute this partial derivative. Uh, <clears throat> as we have pointed out, these six variables are independent variables in the sense, right? There's a context for this. And the context, once again, is suppose you're in the laboratory, you prepare an experiment. The initial conditions are you must choose an initial position for the particle. You must choose an initial velocity vector. Those are six numbers you have to choose. Those are the initial conditions. That's the classical state of the particle. In classical physics, you have the notion of the classical state. These six numbers, they fully define the classical state. The subsequent time evolution of the system is determined by those six numbers. Okay, so now we're very comfortable with the idea that these are six independent variables, and that's important to us. We must now use our knowledge of partial differentiation. We're gonna differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to X. The other five variables are held constant. That means it's capital T, the entire thing is just a constant. We're gonna differentiate U with this minus sign, with respect to x. So this is minus the partial derivative of u with respect to x. Now let's think deeply about what we know about conservative forces. Think back to physics 7a or physics 5a, whichever one you took. Minus the gradient of the potential, that's the force. The gradient, we love the gradient, right? It's a collection of differential operators. This is minus the x component of the force, uh, sorry, the gradient, so that's f sub x. Yeah, this is looking very nice. So this partial derivative of the Lagrangian is the x component of the force. And of course, completely analogous remarks for y and z. <clears throat> uh, the partial the Lagrangian with respect to y is the y component of the force. The partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to z is the z component of the force. Okay, wonderful. So uh, let's start. There are some other partial derivatives. You know, we must also compute partial derivatives with respect to x dot. Just as in chapter six, we had to compute partial derivatives of f with respect to y prime. We're going to compute this partial of Lagrangian with respect to x dot. And again, these six variables are six independent variables. We must look for occurrences of x dot. There's only one occurrence of x dot, it's right here. The potential u does not depend on x dot. There's one occurrence of x dot here. Let's differentiate with respect to x dot. So x dot, <coughs> here's the kinetic energy. x dot is now a fundamental variable. It's, right, x dot, that conglomeration really of two symbols, that's thought of as a fundamental atomic unit now in our calculation, we must differentiate this with respect to x dot. Well, this is a constant times x dot squared. So the derivative, we we'll bring down the two, cancels the two very nicely. Yep. M times x dot. Okay. <clears throat> 
And this is the X component of the momentum. Okay, wonderful. So now the Euler-Lagrange equations in our new notation, here's what we got. Okay, so what we're saying is uh, <clears throat> you appeal to chapter six, look at the chapter six summary. The most important formulas are there, chapter six summary. This is uh, the very central result, the Euler-Lagrange equations. You know, there's a minus sign and a zero. We simply move that term over here and we change notation. Chapter seven, obviously we're using script L for that little F, et cetera, and so forth. So this is the X component of Newton's second law, right? We have <coughs> F sub X equaling DDT right so force equals mass times acceleration that's the same as saying force is time derivative of uh, momentum right? and so <coughs> completely analogous remarks for the y and z directions and so we summarize here the force vector time derivative momentum vector yeah, so this is really great. You see what we've done here? We've shown for the case of unconstrained motion in a three-dimensional space, we have a point particle, it's moving in a three-dimensional space. There could be one or more forces acting on it. And when we say force, we're talking about vector fields that are conservative. So a gravitational field, perhaps an electric, an electrostatic field, et cetera. Those are examples of forces that are conservative. Okay, and so we have this nice, um, <clears throat> this nice picture that's emerging here. All right. Okay, so we, uh, again, from our first year physics course, oh, um, we have a question. Forces like friction. Yeah, that's right, we do not have friction. That's right, that's a good point. Uh, that's an example of a force that's not conservative, right? Um, yeah. So friction, of course, in our first year physics course, we did talk about friction, and we talked about friction in chapter five. Um, <clears throat> however, this uh, Lagrangian formulation uh, is for conservative forces, that's right. There, there are maybe a couple examples where you can artificially cook up a very strange Lagrangian. It's not the usual kinetic minus potential, but if you apply the prescription that we have, to compute these partial derivatives, then you do get an equation of motion with friction, but we won't be talking about that because it's, it's rather artificial construction. So yeah, <clears throat> what we're gonna do here in chapter seven is uh, treat cases where there's no friction, no dissipation. Yep, that's a good point. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's now talk about generalized coordinates. This discussion we just had, we use Cartesian coordinates. Okay, generalized coordinates. Let me scoot this over here. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so we went through a very nice calculation um, uh, showing how <clears throat> for the motion of a particle in a three-dimensional space, con conservative force, we have now a variational principle um, which gives us the uh, correct equation of the motion. In other words, the differential equation that we must solve is exactly what you get from Newton's second law. Um, the notion of generalized coordinates, again, this is one of the amazing and powerful things about the Lagrangian formulation. Um, we like to use spherical coordinates sometimes, we like to use cylindrical, and there are others, right? Confocal hyperbolic coordinates, etc. There are some fancy coordinates that have official names, and then furthermore, for any given problem, you may <laughs> find that you can define some novel coordinates. You may find for a given problem because of the geometry that you find it useful to introduce some new coordinates and you can put your name on those coordinates because you invented them. 
all of these choices of coordinates are acceptable here. So <clears throat> let's uh, first recall in our book, this R vector, so there's the lowercase r. When we write it by hand, we put the arrow over it. In the book, this is typeset as a boldface lowercase r. So that sometimes causes confusion, but it's a fundamental convention that we have um, that these things in, in the book, they're boldface. When we write it by hand, you put an arrow. Okay, so that thing is just shorthand. So it's a point in a three-dimensional space and the Cartesian coordinates are X, Y, and Z. <laughs> okay, so for generalized coordinates, and it's really good just to think about spherical coordinates uh, or cylindrical coordinates. Um, the idea is you have three coordinates. The notation we use for generalized coordinates are these Qs. So there will be three of these Qs, Q1, Q2, and Q3. And these are functions, so our notation is like so. The mathematical framework is the same for cylindrical and spherical and any other generalized coordinates. The idea you have three functions of position. <clears throat> so this is for i. This i is an integer. It's not to be confused with imaginary unit. This i is one, two, and three. We have these three functions, <clears throat> q1, q2, and q3. Okay, and um, so depending on your location in space, we have three values for these Qs. Conversely, your uh, Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z, are functions of the Qs. Q1, Q2, Q3. Okay, so this is what we mean when we say generalized coordinates. <clears throat> Okay, nice example. Spherical coordinates, we'll be using spherical coordinates throughout the course. Okay, um, so there you have the R, theta, phi, okay. And so we'll say, for example, Q1, you don't have to choose this sequence, but one, one possibility is say Q1 is R, Q2 is theta, and Q3 is phi. All right? And let's be very clear. We must have great clarity on these functions. <clears throat> so let's continue. Uh, okay, wait, we got a question in the in the chat window. Can R also include a time variable? Uh, no, in our formulation, R is just the position. So uh, yeah, that's a good point. If you, if you make a comparison between a three-dimensional space and a four-dimensional space, for a four-dimensional space time, you would have X, Y, Z, and T. That would be a location in a four-dimensional space time. But what, for what we're doing here, we're going to treat uh, the spatial variables and the time variables separately. <clears throat> and we have a, a very strict and dedicated definition here. This R vector is always just X comma Y comma Z. And the time T is treated separately. <clears throat> okay. So then let's uh, just um, fill in the picture here. For this choice of spherical coordinates, let's exhibit these functions. So the Q's are functions of position. So an example here would be um, r. Each of these coordinates, we must be able to write it as a function of x, y, and z. So r, we have a very clear formula. OK. Um, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Theta, you know you can get theta by looking at the angle between the r vector and the positive z direction. <clears throat> so again, you can write down a formula. We're going to skip all the details because we don't have time. Phi, of course, what you do there is you look at the projection of the point into the xy plane. And then again, you, 
you would do a certain arc tangent calculation to get uh, the phi value. So there are other formulas here that the Q's can be written as functions of x, y, and z. In other words, if you know x comma y comma z, then you can compute these. And if that's true, then there must be formulas. So I'm skipping the other formulas just to save time. The other direction, if you know the Q's, then you must be able to compute the position. Okay. So there's a, a group of three formulas here. There's another group of three formulas, which is x equals r. Okay, now let's think about this. The sine, we got a sine theta, right? This gives you uh, the distance away from the uh, uh, z-axis, and then the cosine phi, okay? So again, there are three formulas. I'll save some time. I won't write them all out. The point is we have these three formulas. Okay, so they fit very nicely into these boxes. So um, this discussion here on the right is an example because uh, there's a certain mathematical framework. We've defined generalized coordinates here uh, in some abstraction, right? This is an abstract uh, definition. <clears throat> there are functions, and it's the existence of these functions that are very, that's very important to us, the existence of the functions. For any choice of uh, coordinates, spherical coordinates, for example, you can write out these functions. Uh, for example, r is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and there are formulas you can write for theta and phi. <clears throat> Same thing here. Uh, y, r sine theta, sine phi, et cetera, z, r cosine theta. So <clears throat> this is the framework now for the generalized coordinates. And the remarkable thing, we can get this directly from the variational principle, is that you can then formulate the equations of motion. Okay, so we're going to see, we'll talk about this more. Okay, this is the remarkable thing, <clears throat> okay? Again, we'll, we'll revisit this equation later in the chapter, but uh, this now really is one of the crown jewels of the Lagrangian formulation, okay? You can choose any coordinate system you like, right? Remember that the actual problem typically has some sort of symmetry, perhaps spherical coordinates, uh, right? Especially if you have a, a very massive star at the origin, this problem, um, has a spherical symmetry. So there's a, a central, there's a force center. And when we say massive star, the idea is we can safely assume, right? It's a very good approximation to assume the star remains at the origin of our coordinate system. And maybe you have a spaceship orbiting the star, or maybe it's a comet, et cetera, and so forth. For that problem, uh, which we will investigate in chapter eight, um, <clears throat> spherical coordinates are wonderful. And you see um, this approach, gives you a very clear prescription. You just write down the kinetic energy in spherical coordinates, the potential, no problem there, it's just a function of R. Okay, so that's um, uh, one of the, this is where the Lagrangian formulation really shines. You can easily uh, implement any coordinate system you like, and um, you can just turn the crank, right? This is a prescription telling you exactly which partial derivatives to compute, then as always, after you compute this partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qi dot, then you insert the functions, right? So first you compute the partial, then insert the functions qi of t and qi dot. Right? So first you compute this partial derivative of the Lagrangian, then you insert the functions qi of t and qi dot of t. The resulting object is a function only of the time t. So this is the correct notation. That's an ordinary derivative because it's understood that you've done this functional composition and you have now just a function of t. Then you compute the ordinary time derivative of that. Okay, so it's a very nice clear prescription. 
it requires some effort, right? It can get a little bit messy, but the prescription is very clear. So we'll start going through some examples here. <clears throat> okay. All right. So um, <clears throat> we'll go through some examples for um, uh, choices of coordinates, the cylindrical, the spherical, et cetera. Okay, so again, this discussion has been for unconstrained, right? Remember when we introduced this, we talked about unconstrained motion. Okay. Um, and we will go through this in great detail to see uh, more and more examples of how this works. But the point is, um, this formulation of mechanics also works for constrained motion. So you can have a particle, imagine taking a piece of wire and bending it into a funny shape and let's say this is a stiff piece of wire and you have a bead which can slide without friction on the wire, okay? And your job is to figure out uh, the, uh, the motion of the particle, solve for the position as a function of time. You can do this very easily using the Lagrangian formulation, okay? So um, it turns out that uh, this idea of constraints, And as I mentioned earlier, the Lagrangian formulation makes it so easy to solve these problems with constraints that some, some people feel it's unfair. It gives you the answer so quickly that you don't really get uh, the physical insight. Now, just to say, you can compute uh, the motion, you can find the evolution, the time evolution of the system without having to solve for the constraint forces. So an example here, Okay, if you have a rigid wire, and it's some funny shape, that's my opportunity to get crazy. I, I, I hope you don't think that's a sharp kink. We cannot have a sharp kink. Maybe I got too crazy. Let's smooth out those sharp, yeah. It's gotta be a smooth piece. You can't have a kink, that's not fair, right? So. Uh, it's a rigid wire, it's smooth, and here's a point particle. Okay, so a bead sliding without friction. <clears throat> this is an example of a constraint force. Um, as the bead slides, <clears throat> there is certainly uh, some sort of force between the bead and the wire. We know the force will be perpendicular to the wire. Right? The wire does not serve to accelerate or decelerate the particle uh, in the direction of the wire. However, there's a constraint force. Um, right? We can do the simple example of a circular piece of wire and talk about centrifugal force, et cetera, centripetal force. Uh, but this is an example of constraint. So <clears throat> let's say a few more words about constraints. Okay? It turns out there are some fascinating applications. And uh, <clears throat> recently I was talking to a researcher uh, who works in robotics. So <clears throat> obviously robotics is, uh, is a fascinating field. Uh, looking ahead to possible you know, future career options. What are some future career options? And robotics you know, is, is something that is always going to be actively uh, developed. So <clears throat> one thing they do is they build robots that have multiple fingers, just like a human hand. So multi-fingered robots. Let's talk about multi-fingered robots and some of the special considerations. You wanna have a robot which can manipulate objects. And the crucial thing here is the no-slip rolling condition. A no-slip rolling condition is a very special form of constraint. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about constraints in general. Let's make some general remarks about constraints. There are the so-called polynomic constraints. Okay, and let me, let me be clear, this example, this example is over here. It's not directly connected to our current discussion. Uh, <clears throat> holonomic constraints, I think what I'll do is get another piece of paper here. Uh, for the holonomic constraints, 
um, they can be expressed uh, using functions of the coordinates themselves. Okay, so it's a constraint that can be expressed using just functions of the coordinates. Let's do a special case. Here we'll have, um, here's our three dimensional space. Uh, when I draw these three perpendicular axes, here's X, Y, and Z. This is supposed to conjure up an image of a three dimensional space. These are the familiar perpendicular axes. Now suppose you have a circular loop This is a perspective view and I'm using the pencil here uh, I'm doing my best here with this pencil to <clears throat> Yeah, so Using pencil, that's the negative y-axis here, there's the negative x-axis. Uh, this is a circular loop, it's in the xy plane. Okay, circular loop in the xy plane. If a particle is constrained, so again, suppose you have a bead, you took a piece of wire, you made this circular loop in the xy plane. If there's a bead that must move, sliding without friction on that loop, what can you say? Well, you can say x squared plus y squared equals r squared, and you can say z equals two, uh, zero. Two would be crazy, right? Z equals zero. So that's a nice example here. Okay, this is an example. We have a particle, so there's some massive particle here. I got to really draw some sort of blob here. There it is. That would be the bead. It has mass m and um, <clears throat> it's constrained to move on this loop. Now you could apply some forces. Maybe there's a gravitational force pointing it some direction, uh, et cetera. There could be, uh, you could have some apparatus that produces electric forces and makes that bead move around, et cetera. So again, holonomic constraints can be expressed uh, using functions of the coordinates. For the more complicated constraints, such as if you have a multi-fingered robot, if this thing is gonna manipulate an object, so for example, I can do this on the document camera. See, I'm rolling the pen. I'm rolling the pen between my fingers. I'm a multi-fingered robot. I'm a multi-fingered robot. I can pick up this pen cap. I can, I can roll it between my fingers. I can manipulate it because we have the no slip rolling condition. So multi-fingered robots, this is fundamentally different. When you have no slip rolling conditions, these are anholonomic. So let's put together a quick summary of the differences. Right. And you know, if you've looked at that document at midterm one, <laughs> the stuff with the anholonomic con uh, constraints, not on the midterm exam. But I claim it's useful to talk about this to really get a better understanding of what holonomic constraints are. So let's talk about the comparison. This will be a fun comparison. We're going to compare holonomic constraints and anholonomic constraints. Okay, so this is, again, it's one of these exciting comparisons. Holonomic and anholonomic constraints. Okay, if you speak Greek, you know that the opposite of holonomic is anholonomic. Anholonomic, that means not holonomic. Okay, so remember a holonomic constraint, I'll point with a pen, a holonomic constraint 
is a constraint that can be written uh, just with reference to the coordinates. For the anholonomic constraints, we're going to also talk about the velocity. All right. So this will be a nice uh, example, a side-by-side -side example, uh, a sliding ladder. Okay, so example, a sliding ladder. <clears throat> Let's draw a picture, the side view, and we use uh, some drawing conventions here. This is a side view of the problem. We have concrete, All right? Anytime you see this kind of technique here with the uh, diagonal hatching, cross hatching, whatever it's called, that indicates you have a rigid, that's a rigid floor. This is a rigid wall. This is a side view. Okay, so that's a side view, and here's this ladder. You have a ladder leaning against the wall and it slides out. So yeah, it's gonna start rotating. The center of mass is moving and it's rotating. This would be a pain to solve this uh, using Newtonian, uh, you know, good old force equals mass times acceleration. You got to figure out how quickly it's rotating, et cetera. Using the Lagrangian formulation, this becomes a very simple problem. So the sliding ladder, um, the length of the ladder is L. Notice that's a regular capital L. We will often use regular capital L for length, maybe sometimes for angular momentum, but we must use the cursive capital L for the Lagrangian. So this is L for length. Okay, it could be L for ladder, fair enough, but as long as it's not cursive, we're happy, okay? So the length is L. You know, <clears throat> let's put an X axis here. So this point here is the point X comma zero, right? And we have another point of contact here, Y comma zero, also known as yo. Oh, no, 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 no. Scratch it. Zero comma y. There we go. Okay, so the constraint, and again, this is a whole number constraint. We have L squared equals X squared plus Y squared. That's our constraint. So <clears throat> one speaks of the configuration space. What are all the allowed configurations here for this problem? And typically for the latter, you don't enforce some special mechanism for the contact, right? In fact, when this ladder slides out, eventually you can see there will come a point where this end leaves contact with the vertical wall, right? You can prove that because the center of mass, you know the center of mass is gonna start moving to the right. Then near the end, when the ladder is close to the floor, right? Uh, we know that the center of mass is moving to the right, so it's simply not possible that this upper end of the ladder will remain in contact with the wall. If you like, you can remove that problem by saying there's some sort of collar sliding around a, a vertical post. Okay, so those are details of the mechanical setup. For the moment, we'll just say um, we're treating a regime, right? <laughs> it is that we have differential equations which, which we're gonna solve. Let's assume that we're analyzing a portion of the motion where the ladder is still in contact with both ends. Okay, and then it's logically a separate question. When does the ladder leave and no longer contact the vertical wall? Okay, that's a separate question. Uh, but for the moment, we'll simply uh, assume that there are these two constraints here. All right, two points of contact and it's sliding without friction. So again, this is a nice holonomic constraint. Uh, we have a formula that makes reference only to the coordinates. All right, let's look at an anholonomic this, here's an example, an exciting example. And I know some of you are going into space, so you will probably think back on this when you're up there. We're going to talk about a space station. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going. I'm too old. But for you, there's hope. 
Okay, so uh, space station. This is a special space station. And let's talk about, there's a constraint. Ultimately, <clears throat> the constraint is uh, that the angular momentum is a constant. So let's choose zero here. The constraint So this is angular momentum. So this very interesting story that we're telling here serves also to remind us that the capital L, let's just watch out, let's be on our guard here. Here, capital L is the length, completely standard choice of symbology. L is length measured in meters. Here, L, this is actually very standard notation, L is angular momentum, right? Angular momentum, kilogram meter squared per second. And did we talk about Planck's constant earlier? Once again, angular momentum, same dimensions as Planck's constant. Okay, um, <clears throat> so yeah, for the space station, if you're on a space station, and let's assume for simplicity that the angular momentum, the total angular momentum of the system is zero. And let's assume that you're far away from any sort of strange gravitational field which would cause a torque, all right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, this is a good assumption. If you're, in a, if you're on the International Space Station, for example, and uh, you're orbiting Earth, the torque on the, on the space station is very small. And let's just assume the torque is zero. So this is a constant. And for our problem, we're going to assume that the angular momentum is zero, okay? So now, if you're on the space station, you can do some interesting stuff. Uh, imagine you have a bicycle wheel amongst your uh, laboratory equipment, right? Get the bicycle wheel spinning, you're holding the axle, get it spinning pretty good and then flip it over. Whatever goes on here, you know that the total angular momentum of the space station and everything inside, including you and the bicycle wheel, the total angular momentum is zero. <clears throat> okay, so you can do some interesting, you can cause the exterior of the space station to rotate, all right? So that's, uh, well, I just described is a little bit complicated. We're gonna look at the same, <clears throat> the same basic takeaway message. You can cause an overall rotation of the space station, even though the total angular momentum is zero. Now for our space station, let's draw a picture. Okay, I'm drawing a two-dimensional picture here. We can illustrate the interesting physics here that if you need to rotate that space station, you can do it. Even though the total angular momentum is zero, that's the total angular momentum of the space station and everything inside, you can still uh, cause a rotation. And if you like biology, we can talk about biology. There are single cell organisms, right? Very simple little organisms, Think of a little blob. We're especially interested in the cell wall. So some sort of little blob. I, I won't just draw a blob on the paper. But these things can propel themselves through a fluid just by changing their external shape. And as a simplified discussion, suppose you have a spherical shell and then suddenly a, like a protrusion emerges and then it's like we inflate a spherical balloon at one end and we deflate the other. Okay. After a while, you now have a sphere at a new location. So a single cell organism can propel itself through a fluid by changing its shape. It's a related problem. Um, we're gonna go through this discussion here with three degrees of freedom. Sorry, two degrees of freedom, three generalized coordinates. So this space station, let's draw a picture. Okay. Uh, there are these two motorized arms. Okay, so here, you know, space stations can look like that. They got the various living quarters out there and uh, these trusses, right, to have some good rigidity. Okay, so we have four masses. For this simplified discussion, we're going to assume there's a a mass M here, a mass M here, a mass M here, and a mass M here, okay? 
We'll ignore the mass of the central. The, the center of mass is here. It doesn't matter if you put, if you add or subtract mass from that. It's not going to affect the motion. Okay, so we'll assume that this arm here is a constant. We like to use capital R for a constant. We'll assume that this arm here also a capital R for that one. Okay, and now these two arms, they're motorized. You can extend them or retract them. So that's going to be a little r of t. And this is going to be a little r. We'll assume that the motors are set up in such a way that these two arms always have the same length. It's little r of t. You also have a motor that controls this angle here, theta. OK, I had to squeeze in here. Let's put a reference line parallel to the x-axis. That's a reference line parallel to the x-axis. And we're going to call this phi. OK, so we have these three variables. We have r of t. These are going to be functions of time as you go about life on the space station. r will be a function of time. Theta will be a function of time. And uh, phi will be a function of time. <clears throat> OK, now in our textbook, we have some conventions. We're going to see that this problem has two degrees of freedom. And three generalized coordinates. OK, so that's important to keep track of the number of degrees of freedom and the number OK. Over here, for the sliding ladder, we're going to see there's one degree of freedom. And one generalized coordinate. OK. So let's talk about the big picture here because we're running out of time. We only have two minutes, unless I'm mistaken, we have just two minutes left. Okay, uh, the time sure flew by pretty quickly. Okay, we are singing the praises of the Lagrangian formulation. One of the wonderful things about the Lagrangian formulation of mechanics is you can easily deal with problems with constraints. <clears throat> okay, we need to introduce the technical terms holonomic and anholonomic, that's the opposite. We're going to, in our next meeting, we'll talk about this some more. These are two uh, quintessential examples. For the sliding ladder, you could use x as a coordinate. You can solve the problem and find x as a function of time. You can use y, or you could use an angle. You have an angle here. It turns out you can use that angle. You can set that up, uh, call it q, right? We like to use q as a generalized coordinate. Um, <clears throat> And we'll talk about how you can set up and solve this problem of the ladder sliding against the wall. Okay, we're going to see one degree of freedom, one generalized coordinate. Degree of freedom, that's a technical term that we'll define. It's interesting to have an example. Again, this stuff will not be on the exam. It will not be on the midterm, will not be on the final, et cetera, and so forth. But it's just useful to, to know that this subject matter is out there to have a better understanding of the world of holonomic constraints. So for an anholonomic constraint, and this is the constraint here. Remember, the constraint here was that the length is a constant, right? The constraint here, L is zero. And in particular, uh, our constraint is going to be LZ equals zero. The Z axis perpendicular to the XY plane here, OK? We're going to see that this constraint involves uh, time derivatives of the coordinates. It's logical that when you compute angular momentum, you'll get time derivatives of the coordinates. OK, uh, so this brings us to the end of the hour. Uh, what I'm going to do is stop the recording. And um, OK, just a second here. Uh, I have to resize this thing. Yep. OK, I got to resize the window again. I do have to stop this recording. There we go.